Yeah, we, we've we've mentioned a lot of the um, fi- the, the physical side, the, the physical effects on the body. But one thing that I think is becoming a, a, a popular topic, um, especially in the in the health space in podcasts at the moment, is uh, dementia or, yeah. or the mental effects. And you know, everyone's worried about you know one day when they grow up suffering from Alzheimer's. I think we've all seen the effects that it has. Is there a link between uh, insulin? resistance and Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, yeah, in fact, I love that you're bringing that up. That's one of the main motivations for me to adhere to the diet that I do, which basically is the points that I just mentioned. Because of my fear of Alzheimer's disease and seeing my grandma go through that, it terrifies me. So yes, uh, in fact, I'm alluding to that connection already. Yes, uh, Alzheimer's disease is very intimately connected to insulin resistance. In fact, people refer to it, actual di- uh, Alzheimer's scientists refer to it as insulin resistance of the brain, or they'll say that it's kind of a unique type of diabetes and they'll call it type three diabetes. I don't agree with that latter classification. It's simply insulin resistance. I've mentioned earlier how insulin will control the movement of glucose into some cells. Well, the brain to some degree depends on insulin to stimulate that glucose uptake. And as the brain starts to become insulin resistant, the brain's need for glucose is up here, but now as it becomes insulin resistant, it it creates this energetic gap where glucose can't fill all of the energetic need of the brain. And so now the brain is left with this energetic deficit, wondering, well, I'm, I'm starving. I can't get all the energy that I need. And the brain does have a high energy demand. And so in order to just continue to survive, the brain's going to have to turn down its functions. And that would be manifest as some degree of cognitive decline. Now, to make this very relevant, we are just about to publish. We've already had it accepted for publication. We're just doing the final editing before it gets formally published. This manuscript where we um, explored the expression of metabolic genes in human brain samples. So these are post-mortem samples of people who died without Alzheimer's disease and compared that with people who died with confirmed Alzheimer's disease. And we looked at the expression of genes involved in glucose metabolism and ketone metabolism in four distinct set areas of the brain, like the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus and a couple others. We found that almost every gene involved in glucose metabolism from the taking in of the glucose and the breaking down of the glucose was significantly down in the Alzheimer's brains compared to the normal brains. However, the genes involved in ketone metabolism, there were, I think, a couple that were down, but otherwise they were totally normal across both sets of these brains. So in Alzheimer's disease, there is, there is in fact a quantifiable, you can measure this, reduction in the, in the degree to which the brain takes in and metabolizes glucose even before Alzheimer's in in early cognitive decline. So much of the problem with Alzheimer's, as much as we have focused on plaques for decades, these brain plaques disrupting the brain, that has just not held up under intense scrutiny. What is still um, a viable theory is that Alzheimer's disease, as happens with, mind you, with other neurological problems like migraines and epilepsy, it's really a problem of energy where it's an energy deficit of the brain. And and as I said, the evidence just continues to support that idea. So, and then again, to make it back to, to bring it back to insulin resistance, <clears throat> insulin tells the brain, like it does every cell, what to do with energy. And if insulin isn't working well, then the brain just doesn't know what to do. The body is swimming in a sea of, of glucose in these instances, and yet the brain feels like it can't get enough to drink. Wow. So I think everyone at this point listening who's made it this far, they probably sat up right now. Their mind's probably thinking, right, I want yeah, to get to work so. on this. So for, for those people, as we start to wind down now, if we could give them some practical takeaways that they could start doing today, things they can start being conscious about today, uh, what, what, what practical things you, could, would you recommend for them to, do, mm-hmm. to start being conscious of? Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's a great question. I would say change breakfast tomorrow. Overnight, as someone has been sleeping, insulin has slowly been coming down, which is a wonderful thing. I am totally convinced that the key to a healthy long life is keeping insulin low as much as possible. Not that it's a villain. It'll come up sometimes and it should, but we need to keep it as low as possible, as much as possible. 
So as overnight, insulin has been coming down. And then in the morning, tragically, as so often happens everywhere in the world, this is not just a Western problem, breakfast is based on a starchy, sugary meal. You know, it's a bagel and sweetened coffee. It's two bowls of cereal and a glass of orange juice. Basically, it's pure garbage. It will spike up insulin. It will spike up glucose. And so the average person wakes up. Insulin has finally come down, and it's been down for a few hours, helping the body be a little more insulin sensitive, activating some fat burning. And then we just turn it all off, and we, we – slam down on the fat burning we start that we spike up the insulin and then unfortunately by starting the morning that way it basically sets the person up to fail the rest of the day because two or three hours later the insulin and the glucose start coming down and the person senses this hunger even though there's no reason they should be hungry and they have to do it again and they do it again and they do it again and so they're spending every waking moment in a state of elevated insulin and that is a wonderful way to get fat and sick Wow. So change breakfast tomorrow, <clears throat> follow those three rules, control carbs, prioritize protein, fill with fat. And if you're going to eat, follow those rules or alternatively fast through breakfast. That's almost always what I do. I will take and I'll drink a cup of yerba mate, like a tea. I'll drink a cup of tea and I'll be making breakfast for my children. And I'll certainly allow more liberties for my children, but I always make breakfast. That's just sort of the dynamic in the home. And so this morning I made these kind of lower carb, higher protein and fat waffles. And I let them have as much butter as they wanted. They could use syrup. I don't mind. These are little growing kids. I want them to enjoy the waffles. And we were talking as they were eating breakfast and we're just busy in the mornings and I'm just sipping my cup of tea. Now I will have a big lunch and I will follow those three rules again. And then later today I'll have dinner with my family. And my rule on dinner is I will eat dinner with my family. Now, my wife tends to look at nutrition similarly as I do, so it's rarely that dinner is going to be very unhealthy. But regardless, I will eat dinner with my family, and then that gets me to maybe my second rule. So the first rule is control breakfast tomorrow, and then my second rule would be when dinner is over, stop eating. Be done. In fact, relevant to the, what we were talking about earlier, the single most helpful thing I have ever done to improve my sleeping is not eating within about three hours or so before I go to bed, more if I can do it. Uh, going to bed on a full stomach is a wonderful way to make sure that you sleep miserably. It absolutely will, it'll make you hotter. Your stomach will be bothering you. Um, your heart rate will be higher um, this entire time while your body is very working very hard to digest when it wants to be sleeping and slowing things down. Having a full stomach won't let you do that. So change breakfast tomorrow <clears throat> or fast through it entirely, but that would still be changing it. And then second, stop eating after dinner. Don't don't snack. If you, for me, that's when my cravings are the worst. I confess, I will um, I will have club soda or sparkling water um, with ice, and I will just put in some apple cider vinegar. It's very tart, and it's just as a nice thing I can sort of be sipping on in the evening, helping the kids with homework or getting them to bed, and then watching a show or whatever it may be. So have a strategy to help get through that evening, which is when most people have the most cravings.